everyone, and welcome back to the Sander Lanch Podcast. I am Joe, and today with me, as always, is... Data. Jack. And Jamie. And we are talking about today the short story, Sixth of the Dusk, in which we, we meet this guy. He's a trapper. His name turns out to be the title of the story, so go figure. And uh, he's gone back to his home island where some crazy wacky magic stuff's going on with his birds a lot of a lot of bird magic uh which we find out later is worm magic which is pretty interesting and uh you know he meets a lady they kind of fall in love i guess uh and he rescues her she rescues him they they fight some sightless monsters and uh then they vow to make sure that the Basically, the sky dwellers don't ever get their land. So, you know, fun ta- fine times are had by all. So that's that's what we're doing today. Uh, so hold on to something, everybody. The Sander Lanch is about to begin. The beating of a lonesome heart on a battered and barren road. Together, though we're worlds apart, in unison, bear the load. But we will never hold the weight. If we cannot communicate, pass it on, not yet gone. And we will ever isolate, if we cannot communicate, pass it on. So, yeah, and before we get into it, uh, you guys, the new song, the one you song that we're going to have here is once again, Miracle of Sound. This one is called Never Alone, based on the video game Death Stranding, which I never played, so I don't really know anything about. Death anyway. Stranding, yeah, I don't know anything about that either. I think I heard that one was pretty good, but yeah, I never played it either. Seems to have good ratings, so, you know, there, there, there's something. There you go, Death into- Stranding fans, this one's for you. <laughs> Honestly, once I was reading the ch- the story, I'm just like, did Miracle of Sound do a song based off Moana? Because I feel like that would probably fit here. <laughs> it kind of, it's got a little bit of that, uh, definitely that heritage to it, right? The yeah. uh, the the wayfinding and such, you know, Pacific Islander stuff. Right? Yeah. So it became clear, I think, very quickly to everyone once you start the story that it was not going to be what Joe hoped for with the planet hopping and such. But uh, no. What did you guys think of? Sixth of the Dusk. So I have to preface my thoughts by saying sometimes my voice comes out kind of sarcastic when I'm not intending to be sarcastic. So I'm going to say this off the bat. I'm not being sarcastic here. I'm being extremely genuine. I think this is the best thing that we have read so far. I really, really liked it. Uh, I think it's the best written thing we've read. I think it's the most interesting thing we've read. This has been by far my most favorite thing that we have read so far. I really, really liked it. Can't stress that enough. Uh, Sixth of Dusk is very interesting, very cool, very, uh, and I like the vibe, even if it is a little derivative of, of, you know, uh, Polynesian culture. That's like, you know, it's still really cool. The, the, talents that they that the aviaries dis- bestow on on their masters very cool concept very interesting so yeah i mean from from the beginning of it to the end the beginning i'll, I'll actually say this the beginning of it was a little slow for me when when he's getting onto the island that part i was kind of like oh, man what is this going to be like and then as soon as he gets on the island and the explanation of the corpse thing happens i'm just like this is amazing uh, so yeah, really, really liked it. I feel like this, maybe people are always talking about making a Mistborn video game. I feel like this concept where it's like, you're walking through the super dangerous jungle and you can see like a corpse where you're going to die, but you don't necessarily know exactly how it died or how to yeah. make sure you avoid it. That could be an amazing video game. That could be cool. Yeah. Kind of yeah. like Sands of Time, but, but you know, you, you, you precognition it instead of reverse it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I agree. I don't know if this is my favorite thing we've read so far, but it's definitely up there. This was really cool. I think it was nice to most of the other stories we've read have all been like in cities or in palaces or in like this. This one's very much out in the wilderness. So it's very far removed from most of the other stuff we've read, which was really cool. And I I like the touch of the Pacific Islander culture because we've I mean, we, we, we see a lot of it down here. It's like we don't have any 
here specifically, but we've been to New Zealand, Fiji, and we went to Hawaii. So we've seen like a bunch of the different cultures and how they fit. So like picturing all that in my head while reading this was like, it's a really fun, really different sort of story. I liked, the, I liked the island. I liked the magic system. I liked the monsters and stuff on the island. Like, yeah, just like everything, everything about this was really cool. I've the, and I love Sixth as a character. He's probably one of my favorite Sanderson characters we've read so far. I loved it. Yeah, I hoped you guys would appreciate the. It's it's very different, like you say, from the sort of story we've read so far, and it's also very intense and very self-contained. So uh, uh, even even though the ending is clearly it's leaving you know, open for more happening in this. And he has already said he's working on like a second short story set on this planet or whatever, but it, it's a very self-contained story. And like, you see the character's arc through just this small, like less than a day's time, it seems like. So uh, I'm yeah. glad that you guys have uh, are enjoying it. Yeah, I too am going to jump on the, I really, really enjoyed this story bandwagon. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. I, like Dak said, you know, we, we've, we've, been to Fiji, we've been to Hawaii, we've been to New Zealand, we've done a lot in sort of that Polynesian culture and I could just see it. Like as soon as he approached the island and the rocky shores and everything, just visually, I think it was just really, really well written. I also, I really appreciated not having to dive through a whole bunch of names and a whole bunch of information thrown at you, given that we actually got to read the whole story. There wasn't a hell of a lot that we had to wrap our heads around. Mm to understand what was going on in the story. And I, I really liked that. And yeah, the character, I, I thought he was very cool, you know, not really wanting to talk to anyone. And then you've got this real talkative one to come along. It's like, oh, why, why, why so many words? Like I know people like that in real life that would just be like, oh my God, stop talking, stop talking. And I a hundred percent am the talker. So <laughs> it's, yeah, that I found it quite, quite funny, their relationship. But I also really enjoyed the the birds as the characters too. I I found myself really quite attached to was it Zach? Zach yeah. Okay. Yeah. I thought she was a really cool bird, and the whole having your bodies everywhere, like seeing all the ways you're gonna die. I can see how that's a really t- useful tool. But wow, that is not a way you'd want to live. Why would anyone oh. want to do this? Why would anyone want to be a trapper? This sounds awful. But Re- yeah, really cool story, really neatly done. And I, I like, you know, the, we, we spoke about on the last episode that this is the the furthest along in the Cosmere. I kind of, I could see myself kind of thinking, oh, it's, yeah, is it dusk of the world? Is it dusk of this island? Is it dusk of the Cosmere? Like, is there something else going on that we're going to find out stories now, potentially future writings of, of Chris's as well, that things, big things are going to happen here. and. I, I like that it's, yes, it's definitely left it open for more story, but it's thinking about it on the Cosmere as a whole. I thought that was really cool as well. Yeah, I agree with you. I'm just, I've often thought when reading this, like, who would volunteer for this? Like, maybe some of the other islands that he talks about aren't as bad as this one, but geez, it's just a horrific life to it's be a, leading. Day to day. That, is, that is rough. That is that is rough. And when I was in Fiji many, many years ago, probably a decade ago now, there's an island that you can go to. It's called Robinson Crusoe Island. And you can stay there or you can just do day trips and stuff. And, I mean, it's it's designed for people like backpackers, really. So you've got you've got a few places to stay, but the island itself is pretty just as it, as it is, you know. And, like, it's bad enough. I got so attacked by sand flies. And I'm like, that to me is like the worst thing that <laughs> you could do. And I'm like, these these ants coming out of everywhere, these deaf <laughs> ants. Like, of course, no, there are thanks. deaf ants. And right. every Fucking time. Fucking ants. I know. <laughs> There's two things I thought of. I thought of the sand flies and I went, wow, deaf ants would be horrible because sand flies were disgusting. And then Dak has a really good story about ants as well. <laughs> Oh my <laughs> so let him God. Tell. <laughs> uh, so... um, but that's also all I could think of. <laughs> yeah. I, this 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 story was ironically like the day after the last time we went to Fiji. Like I I was in a car accident, wasn't too bad. Guy uh, hit me in the door. My airbag didn't deploy, but I uh, fortunately got up with just a broken collarbone, and so no other injuries. That was good. Uh, yeah. Anyway, some helpful people on the side of the road wrenched open my caved-in door and pulled me out and laid me down on the ground to, to wait for the ambulance. And they were just, you know, they pulled off my shoes and were checking my feet. It's like, can you feel that? Can you feel that? And it's like, yeah, yeah, feel that. And it's like, all right, cool. You're not injured, so you're going to have to lie very still. I'm like, 
okay. And then after a couple of minutes, I started twitching and shifting and shifting and twitching. And there's like, you have to lay still. I'm just like, you have put me on an ant's nest. And all these ants were just swarming all over me oh. and biting me. Um, like they weren't big ants, so it wasn't too bad, but there were a lot of them and it sucked. <clears> and <throat> so that's how four people were like trying to reach under my back and scrape the ants away. Someone was spraying me with repellent. The ambulance got there and I don't know what the hell they were thinking, but yeah, like the ants were still everywhere. Like, we got to the, like I eventually got to the hospital. They cut my shirt off me, and like all these ants were coming out of it, and, and everyone's just like, "What the fuck?" And they didn't stop disappearing until like three hours later when I went and got, got X-rayed. I think the X-ray machine must have killed the last of them. That is <laughs> hor- horrific. Oh my god. And since then, <laughs> fuck ants. <laughs> Although I love that you started I, this story with it wasn't that bad. <laughs> it was a car accident. Wasn't the that car bad. accident? Yeah. Is not as bad as the car other. accident. Right. I mean, it ran off your car. You went to the hospital. <laughs> Uh, oh that's God. pretty good. I don't even know what kind I, of ants y'all have down there. These these were just like the tiny little black ones, like the you know like sugar ants. I, I guess I don't know if they have a name. I just call them like the little yeah. ones. The little ones. Yeah. Yeah. The I, uh, ones. They weren't bull ants. Like they weren't jumping jacks. Yeah. We have. I I feel like this has just been my lot in life. I've never been stung by like a bee or a wasp or any type of hornet. But if there is an ant. It will find me, and it will bite me, and it will be inside. Like, I'll be inside, and there's an ant on me somehow. Oh. And, like, it traveled with me from the outside, I guess. I don't know. I get bit by ants very frequently. Nothing like what you experience. So, you know, I'm not <laughs> saying, like, mine is worse than yours. I'm just saying I get bit by oh, ants no. a, lot, a lot more than the I feel like the average person should. Yeah, like, that's that does seem like a weird uh, thing to happen. It's like they just – they're magnetized to you, so – yeah, and uh, we have we have fire ants. You. That's usually the type that Ugh. bite me, and those oh, suck. Fuck. Yeah. But yeah, no, I'm I'm with you though. Ants are the worst. Um, ants suck. Yeah, they're terrible. Uh, I mean, I know you know whatever the law of the ecosystem, they're necessary, but no, they're terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We um like a few weeks after that accident, for some reason, we watched a bug's life, and I'm sitting there just going, man, I hope the grasshoppers win. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck these guys. Yeah. Why can't they just lay down and let the grasshoppers have what they want? Yeah. I, we, we're both like Vathy right now, uh, Dak. We're just like, ants could just die. We don't need them in our ecosystem. Yeah, you know, go, they, right? They, just, they can just go away. Yeah. We literally don't need fire ants in our ecosystem. They're an invasive species, and I hate them. That's true. They were they were carried here a long time ago, so that was, not yeah. you know. Killing off the Texas horned toad. Yep. I don't see many of them these days. Mm. You used to see them all over the place when you were a kid. Yeah, when I was a kid, they were everywhere. And now the the ants have... Few and far between for the Texas children. torn toad, or as we call it, the horny toad. <laughs> you fun... <laughs> oh, fun, geez. fun digression there. This yeah. is exactly like the story that we're going to read, because, yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> Death except ants. Dak would be completely dead uh, in, if it was this... Uh, <laughs> oh, this yeah. Story. One bite, the death ants, and you'd be dead. Dude, he no, says but, they're like the size of a pinhead or something, and one bite kills you. That's not yeah. even fair. Dude, that's yeah. like – but that's everything in this in this island. It's like yeah. he says it every time, one bite, and you're dead. He touches you, and you're gone. I wonder if his uncle got bit by a death ant. That would have been, been a bummer. I think the implication was that it was a night more that got him. That's yeah, yeah, I feel like that's implied, but we yeah. don't know for yeah. sure. And uh, yeah. let's be honest, like, if you die, getting eaten by a blind T-Rex is probably a good way to go. I don't know, I guess it depends on how, how fast it kills you. Yeah. yeah. A blind flying T-Rex? Do they fly? I don't I, think was, so. He says that, that they're bird-like, but I don't think they he fly. Said, so they're more yeah, like I think velociraptors, he's... maybe? Like giant velociraptors? Mm, it could be. He definitely said that, I think, I could have sworn they said flightless at one point, or at least it looked like a large flightless bird. Yeah, oh, yeah. I think I think you're right. Well, let's find out. Let's get into this thing. We start out on the ocean, Gilgamesh on the ocean. Before before we even get to that, I would have to say that this this even the drawing at the beginning of the story was my favorite. Oh, of I mean, the ones it, that we've yeah. seen. and I I think Dak was the only one with this book uh, just handy last time, since obviously since Chet, Dak and J- Jamie share, they can't both have it. But right, I was like, you can look at the picture, and he turned, and he's just like, oh wow, okay. Yeah, yeah not was, gonna lie, I I looked at that and thought, why is Alfred Hitchcock just unleashing the birds on this poor guy? Because <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it seriously was, looks it like all these cool. all these birds have fucked up all the people in here because obviously we didn't know this is like him seeing a vision of right his own corpses it's like he's surrounded by corpses and there are these four birds standing here and most of them seem to be yelling at him so i'm like okay <laughs> that's it's, it's bird demic here 
<laughs> yeah, I actually when when we get to the part here in a second where he talks about how it's his own body, I actually went back and looked at the drawing immediately and was like, wait, yeah, those are all his face in every single drawing. That's those are a pile of bodies. I was like, oh god, what's gonna happen? He's gonna see a thousand of his dead bodies. Yeah, this is a hardcore picture. I think one of them is just a skull. One of them has like all these like blisters or welts rising up. I'm like, what is yeah, happening that, to all of this? That, that'll be the death ants. Probably, yeah, that yeah. would be the death ants or a spider. Yeah, I mean, there's there's some uh, when he tells her to go check the cups later or whatever, he like lists off several other bugs that we never hear about again, but that <laughs> don't sound fun. Yeah, I also like how he gets annoyed with her. It's like, go check the cups. It's like, I'm serious about this. I'm not shitting you. We need to make sure that the cups, there's not something deadly in here. Oh, man. But yes, okay, so we start on the ocean after the picture, and he's got his uh, his two birds. We got Cocurly, and I don't know if, and then, yes, and then Sack, who's hanging out on his shoulder. And apparently, old Sack. This, it says it's like a three-week trip from the home islands out to here, so... I wonder how often he makes this trip. Like, that's a long time to be on the water. I wonder if there's islands in between you can stop off on or if you're just, like, wayfinding the whole time. I kind of understood it that he'd been to, like, the main lands and it was a three-week journey. Like, he was on his way back home. Oh, no, I don't think so because he talks about the home islands and I think that's different from these islands. Like, he doesn't live here. He's, like, this is where he hunts. Yeah. the impression that I get. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, fair enough. It may, be, it may become more I mean, why would you want to live on this island? No, I would that absolutely not. Like, oh, no. Yeah. No, okay, that makes sense. That makes more sense. And so there's a giant something under the water, like a big shadow, and a, and we find out that Kokirli keeps him from uh, being endangered by this thing that senses the minds of its prey. Apparently, that is the common method for predators to hunt because it's not just the underwater ones. The land, uh, the... The death moths or night moths or whatever they're called uh, seem apparently hunt the same way. So all the predators are psychic? Psychic squids. Mm. Yeah, it's like, you know, if you were in Pokemon, but everything wanted to kill you. (laughs) Honestly, they probably should. Like, if Pokemon was was real, like, all of those animals (laughs) would be trying to fuck you up. I think that's, yeah. that's what happens in, like, the new game that just came out. Like, yes. The Pokemon I, just attack you straight uh, up. And I know, digress, you know, digressions aside, but this is going to be worth it. I I know I've been saying, I've been having a great day. I read this story, and then I also played this new Pokemon game. I was skeptical. It is it is extremely fun. I would say, if you were on the fence about getting it, go get it. There's a little bit of a learning curve, so I didn't really start having fun until, like, I figured kind of, I, I, you know, I figured out kind of how the game worked. But uh, it's a it's a great game. Go get it. Uh, hit me up uh, hit me up through the Sanderlanch email, and I will trade with you. I'm I'm I'm, he- I'm here for it. It's fun. It's a fun game. I'm gonna look into. You're talking about is it the the Lucia or Le- no? Legends, it's Legends, Legends Arceus. 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 That's yeah. sorry. Arceus is the word. Legends Arceus. Yeah, it's it's great. It's a great game. I was getting my uh, my mythical Pokemon mixed up. It scratches my Digimon Digital World uh, Digimon Digimon World itch at least really? a little bit. Not mm-hmm. not completely, because there's not as many aspects of it that I enjoy, but it does scratch that itch a little bit. And it's pretty that pretty fun. Original Digimon World, that's a game, right there. Oh, uh, it's a it's a masterpiece. If you if you've never played the original Digimon World on PlayStation, it holds up. Just go play it. It's 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 pretty awesome. I mean, if you don't like Digimon, you probably won't enjoy it. But uh, yeah, I mean, even if you don't like Digimon though, even if you like Pokemon like games, yeah, no, that's true. I would say it's worth it. It's it's a fun game. But we also we got to look pretty quickly here at the level of technological advancement that we can expect because he's like, oh, here's this new modern device I got, this glass faceplate with leather on the sides that lets you look under the water. So not super <laughs> advanced. He's got goggles made from glass. Glass and leather. Yep. So it, it really efficiently gives you an idea of what we're to expect here. This guy's in a canoe going across the ocean. Not uh, not real technologically advanced, and uh, the world is full of giant monsters that sense your brain. So yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, it seems like we're talking maybe mid to late 1800 style tech. And so he's got. He talks about how he's you know he's wayfinding, but he he does carry in one of the new those newfangled compasses just in case, along with some sea charts, gifts from the ones above. And so there's our first our first hint at the enigmatic ones above. And he makes it to the Pantheon, the first of, of, and smallest of the Pantheon Islands. So it seems like the islands are all are like considered 
gods or maybe just named after these gods or something. And that's why it's the Pantheon archipelago or whatever. Well, I guess like there's they have this the whole thing of, um, oh, the birds can only gain their gifts if they come to Pachi. Mm-hmm. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. So it's like there's probably already a reverence that these islands have some sort of power. So it makes sense that they would then be worshipped as gods. Right. Yeah. If you, I never thought about that. But if you're working backwards, like, hey, these islands are the only ones because they're a three week trip from any other islands. These islands are the ones where birds have are magical. So obviously there's something going on here. And yeah, yeah. I guess yeah. That, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, and that's that's just Pachi. Like, I don't know. How, I can't remember how many islands there are, but uh, presumably each of them has some sort of feature that makes people think it's not just because otherwise it'd just be that one that people worship. But no, it sounds like they worship all of them. So they've all got to have some sort of attribute that's mysterious and magical. I think they all have the magical birds, but every it said every bird from every island has to visit Pachi once. And the general public does not know that. But the okay. trappers trappers know that you can't capture one until it's made its trip to Pachi is what it, uh, they say towards the end. But it, uh, it's he says there's 40 some odd islands in the Pantheon. So this is a large archipelago of islands. Wow. And it says the dis from di- from a distance, this archipelago was not so different from the home isles of the Ialakin. Now a three week trip behind him. So that's where I got that from. What he calls the home islands or the home isles are a, th- a three week trip away by outrigger canoe. Uh, it might be <laughs> that might seem further than it actually is uh, to us <laughs> today. I don't know. Right. Yeah, it's like. Uh... What's that? What's that Disney movie that came out with the River Cruise? Jungle oh, Cruise. Uh, Jungle Cruise. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the you know the Germans have a giant U boat. It's like her her people have this giant like iron ship. And he's got you know a canoe. <laughs> Maybe the ones above can give him a jet ski. There you go. You, they can't you... trade information yet until they become more advanced. <laughs> jet, jet skis are okay. It's an exception. <laughs> so, oh, Owen Wilson. That's that's who's gonna play. Um, <laughs> Dusk is Owen Wilson. There you go. No way. <laughs> Never. Brandon said that originally when he wrote this, he because uh, now it refers to him as Dusk. Like when he thinks about himself, he thinks of himself as Dusk. Originally, it was sixth. And apparently that was confusing. So he went back and changed uh, the short version of his name. I mean, I guess I don't see why it'd be too confusing. There are other books where people refer to themselves as numbers. Yeah. I was trying to think of like, oh, who would be a good Islander? actor to play six and i'm just like damn i can't actually think of many it's like basically comes down to jason momoa and the, the rock. entire cast and the entire cast of once for warriors mm. Mm. yeah i would say jason momoa would work if he could slim down maybe if he wasn't so bulky because i feel like the trappers should be more like wiry yeah no nah, jason momoa didn't fit I, like he's a fi- he's a fine actor but i don't think he fits this part right um apparently let's see I sorry, I was I was curious to know if there's any, you know, that would fit. And so I looked up like Pacific Islander actors and uh, number six on the list is Keanu Reeves, who uh, was born in Lebanon. But his dad is native Hawaiian, British, Portuguese and Chinese. All right. Yeah, I think I knew that. I feel like I did. Yeah, he's just a melting pot. Yeah, I feel like Keanu Reeves could totally do it if he was a little younger. I mean, the, the bloke who plays Django and Boba Fett could probably do it if he was younger as well. True. Taika Waititi is on the list. That would not be a good fit for this at all. <laughs> no, I was thinking Taika Waititi, but there is nowhere near enough dialogue for him. <laughs> I mean, you would just be cracking jokes all over the place. Like, Dude, that's not yeah. the character. I think maybe? it'd be more fun if he did. Yeah, exactly. It'd be great. He'd <laughs> just be like, uh... He'd <laughs> be like, yeah, and my boyfriend's mom, who I hate. <laughs> yep. Didn't print enough pamphlets. Wait, wait, wait. Did you say the mom's boyfriend or the boyfriend's mom? He said boyfriend's mom, which is, yeah, that's not <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I said it. I said it wrong. Yeah, my mom's boyfriend. I mean, who I either am. way, it's fine. <laughs> I was I was going to say, like, it changes the dynamic. Totally different story. It very, makes, it makes <laughs> yeah. a very different dynamic, yes. <laughs> yeah. I have a boyfriend, if I didn't say so before, and uh, his mother hates me and I hate her. <laughs> <laughs> He's got Meek. I don't know what gender Meek is. I think they, maybe they refer to, to Meek as a him. I think they did, but they're also just like, is that... So is that eggs? protozoa yeah. coming out of you, or is that eggs? Because it looks like <laughs> eggs. <laughs> anyway. So I, I find it interesting. Like, there's this very in, – in, sorry, back to the story. There's <laughs> there's these very specific, like, traditions and rules that we find out as we go along set up around, like, being a trapper. And it's like you have to sl- – when, once you're done with your training, and everyone trains on the, the little island, sorry – but uh, once you're done with your training, you have to pick one of the other 40 islands, and that's the only one you can ever go to. 
And it's, just, it's, it's just these very stringent like rules for this this job that at the same time are like who wants to like how many people are lining up to go to these islands? And I guess he got he, he ends up here. It sounds like you know because his uncle was a trapper mm. and trained him. So maybe you got to know somebody to get in here. I mean, it sounds to me it sounds like an you know what he says it is an apprenticeship, but but even more so like probably like a family slash friend apprenticeship so it's like you have to find somebody who will take you on yeah in this case you know it's family so you know they were asked but it's but from the way he makes it sound since that's the way they're named well i guess maybe that all the original home islers name themselves that way maybe it's not just the trappers but um yeah, it sounds I, like that's like the traditional naming convention right and obviously we find out that not everybody follows that anymore but that's the, yeah the old way Speak, speaking of old way, that's that's another vibe I get from this. It's just very like Mandalorians. Like this is the way. Yeah, no, I agree that it's very much because later she starts to question some of these, and he's like, "No, she's right, but this is how we do stuff." Yeah, this is this is the way. You don't take off your helmet unless you do, and yeah, then you if, get kicked out. Have you ever taken off your helmet? And then he just sits there and stares at her. She's like, I already know the answer. You just need to answer the question now because you waited way too long to tell me. Yeah, it's like if you waited this long, I'm gonna know that you're lying if you. Say yeah. Uh, <laughs> it would have been. It would have been funny. I mean, not at all right for the mood of the show, but it would have been uh, funny if he was no. like, no, no. <laughs> oh, retroactive spoilers for Boba Fett. Sorry, everyone. Yeah. Uh. So you know, if you if you like if you wanted to watch Boba Fett, but you, you tuned in and then saw the Mandalorian, that happened to everybody. If you didn't want to be spoiled on Boba Fett, then go back in time like 30 seconds and you're good. Right. Exactly. I mean, let's let's just put a timestamp, a disclaimer at the beginning of the video. (laughs) That's all you got to do, right? I'm not doing that. And cut. So it it also and I don't think I remember this when we were talking about a minute ago, but like the giant underwater monsters, they also only live around here. So maybe it's like centered on this place is all the monsters that like sense your brain the psychic beasts yeah well i mean the psychic maybe the psychic energy that they receive is all from the worms or whatever like right it it all comes from that and they all it just the powers manifest in different ways because obviously the birds are psychic too not just like bestowing gifts but there's obviously like a psychic mind connection going on there yeah well Well, i mean just the fact that coker lee's race like shields you from being sensed kind of Shows you they definitely have some psychic stuff going on. Right. They, they also have guts. Yeah, psychic. A, a, it's a food chain thing, you know. If the bird eats the worm and gets the psychic powers and whatever eats the bird probably also gets the psychic uh, powers. So. That's a good point. Maybe those underwater monsters, like, they don't turn psychic until they've eaten a bird. Well, I mean... Well, they've the eaten worms, something that's eaten a bird. Right, yeah. Or, or, I mean, you know, worms exist underwater too, so... Mm, yeah, True. could be. Maybe, maybe the birds poop them out. True. Could be. Fish, Although fish then, ate, like, fish ate the worm. If you took, because apparently they take a lot of these birds to the home island and sell them to people to have AVR. That's what the magic birds are called, AVR. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if they were pooping worms that like turned other things magical, we'd probably find out, or they would have probably fi- found out. AVR sounds like a resolution. So let's. Uh, I, I was going for uh, Avier or Avier. Uh, okay. Because it's like aviary, you know. Yeah, kind of sure. sounds similar. And so there's uh I, that is what trappers, I guess, do. They come here, they get the AV, the avier, AV, AV. I'm not going to be able to. Sorry, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I have already forgotten which way you said to do it, even though you said two Just or three say different. Say it ways. how you need to. Yeah, but I uh, mean, say it how you need to. But when everybody hears it, no, we're not talking about a video resolution. Just. <laughs> but and then they come back and they sell them to. It used to be, I guess, just rich people could afford them, but uh, we find out it's becoming more and more common for other people to get them. So everyone wants a magic bird, basically. I want a magic bird. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I've never wanted a bird as a pet because they're yeah. loud and messy and kind of gross. gross. Yeah. But <laughs> if they gave you magic powers, I would get over right. that real quick. Yeah. I mean, at this point, if you had a bird that could give you psychic powers, why would you not want a bird? Yeah. That's the better question. I mean, I'm, I want to know about – because apparently there's – every different species gives you a different power, and we really only get to see, like, two mm-hmm. or so of them. We get to see the one that hides you from the pr- predators, which, while extremely useful here, would not <laughs> sell real well back home probably. <laughs> and then we see the one that uh, only he has that shows you your own dead body, 
which once again, while cool and extremely useful here, might not sell super well back home where people aren't in life or death situations. Coming. Yeah. Also, like, I, I, I feel like uh, the the birds that hide you from predators might be useful in the real world. So, like, you you got a bird on your shoulder, and it's like you got those guys in an alleyway waiting to mug whoever walks past, and you walk past, they just don't even see you. <laughs> only only if they're sensing you psychically, because that's what yeah. does it, like hide you from the psychic <laughs> senses. Right. Also, as cool as Sack is, that'd be terrifying to uh, have a bird that showed me my dead body, like. <laughs> if I stepped off a curb too quick or, you know, if I if I was a, too klutzy and I fell and snapped my neck, it'd be pretty terrifying. Yeah, can you imagine that, like, you wake up in the morning, you're still half asleep, you're coming down the stairs and you see your dead body at the foot of the stairs. And you're like, <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> it's like, I got to pay better attention, I guess. You wouldn't want to go anywhere or do anything. You'd just be like, ah, there's my dead body. Ah, there's my dead body. <laughs> Also, well, is that this, a problem in, in traffic? Like, if, you, uh, well, yeah, if you're you just driving and you see a car wreck, then you're poking out of it. And it's like, ugh. But it says that he only sh- tends to show him, like, likely deaths. So it's probably not, like, you know, every five feet you'd see one. But I mean, that seems to happen to him, but I guess his life is a lot more dangerous. Uh, yeah, his he's, the, the he's island is hanging on Death Island. Yeah. Oh, gosh. But and I like how not even landing on the shores of Pachi is easy. Everything about this island is mean and difficult. And so it's like, yeah, you know, some of these islands have gradual beaches or sheltered bays. Not Pachi. His beaches were rocky and had steep drop-offs. And also, yeah, by the way... He says, don't come here. Yeah, exactly. Like, how did, you know, like, how did the first people decide, here, I'm going to go there. This is a great idea. But it's, it's probably one of those things where it's like, it was there, so I went. Yeah. I, like, I, I would question less the first people, more the second people. The first people come back and it's like, yep, blind dinosaurs, uh, whatever the hell it is that lives in the water around the place, ants that like murder you in a single bite. And then the second people are just like, you know what? Sounds great. Let's go. <laughs> let's go. The first people probably didn't come back at all. Let's be honest. Yeah, yeah, true. Uh, I mean, I assume a, a trapper is to get the birds. Like that's his job. Yeah, seems seems to be. So you probably get the best birds there because you can't capture them until they've been there. Mm. So if you're set up on another island, unless they catch, bless you. Yeah, if you want the best birds or the highest chance of getting birds that have these abilities, then being there has its benefits. That's true. I mean, you've got to be crazy to set up there, <laughs> but I guess you would you would have a better chance. It, it just occurred to me that like if this is the only place to get the birds that like shield you from the psychic predators then the first people to actually make it here would have had to just, by luck, avoid the giant underwater ones. So those are extremely lucky uh, folks to show up on any of these islands in the first place. Oh, goodness. But yeah, so not so not only all that, but like he's like, the beach is the worst place to be. You know, you can't stay on the beach long because not only do you have the dangers of the island, the giant sea monsters can reach you on the beach to eat you. So you got to get off there quick. Which we never get a description of them, do we? Not really. We uh, he does. He's never seen one before. And finally, like towards the end, he sees a dead one. But I don't think it describes it very much. So it could be a tentacle monster. Could be. Yeah. Giant squid. Yeah. Could be. Could be anything. Could be. Uh, could be a clown. Well, I mean, it, it's <laughs> it, it comes up onto the beach and grabs people. You have to assume it's probably not like a shark or something, because once a shark beaches, it's going to struggle to get back. True. Yep. Well, I think there's claw marks here in a second, so I don't, I don't know here. Let's, let's see. Let's yeah, see. it's like uh, it's like a, it's probably like an alligator, like a giant alligator. Ooh. So yeah, we we get the first what how Joe mentioned the first where as he comes up he sees a corpse bobbing in the water and I don't know what, what were everyone's thoughts when it's just when you see that and then you kind of he kind of explains how this bird works. I was just kind of like, ooh, who's dead? What's going on on this island? This is- <laughs> What, what are we walking into? I didn't expect it to be his own corpse. And I think for a while I was like, can we go back to the corpse? And then it was like, this is, you know, his own body. And I was like, I have no idea what's going on. I'm already lost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not. Uh, I like, I like, a, like, I didn't expect it to be his own corpse. As if that's an expectation that anyone would have. When they got here. <laughs> like, I bet that's his dead body that he's seeing right there. Yeah, it's got to be, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's completely normal to see your own dead body. <laughs> Depends on how drunk you are. Right. My initial thought was like, I I completely forgot this. Like, oh, yeah, this is a universe where magic happens. You know, even though we were just talking about the psychic birds and, and sea monsters, we get there. It's like apparently seeing his own body was where I drew the line. I'm just like, <laughs> oh, yeah. 
that, that is <laughs> magic magic visions. That is something that happens here. Yeah, he gets up and he's like, I gotta get, you know, I can't stay on the beach. Gotta get my canoe off the beach real quick. But then he starts finding stuff. A shirt, broken lengths of sanded wood, pieces of paper. And he's like, oh, those idiots. They're like, oh, what, what what's going on here? He's, he's upset at somebody. He doesn't explain it right away. And then he sees another one of his corpses hanging from a tree. And there are cutaway vines lurking. I like how the plants lurk. Like, this is a serious, <laughs> like, it's not just the animals. The plants are assholes also. <laughs> <laughs> they lurk. <laughs> just hears a voice over the underbrush going, feed me, Seymour. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Somewhere out there, it's like one giant, one of those plants just killing everybody. Yeah, just a giant <laughs> Venus flytrap. Just, yeah. But so apparently it's like, when you get close to the tree, it drops a net of vines on you full of stinging barbs that kills you and lifts you up into the tree to be eaten by the tree. Or so. I don't know, but it's fucked up. I don't think I want to know. No, probably not. Mm. Well, everybody's equally delicious, I suppose. But I like that he uses this to his advantage where he makes the, the vines drop and he's like, it'll take a, a few hours for them to retract. So I'm going to hide my canoe right here so that if any uh, other hunt or trapper comes along, they'll just avoid the tree and they won't find my canoe and then destroy it because we like to sabotage each other. But I also like the way he thinks he's like, you know what? We've been doing trappers have been doing this for hundreds of years. Uh, it's basically the same thing now that it was then, except I have much better, uh, I'm much more well outfitted than they were. I'm not wearing a simple wrap that leaves my chest exposed and, uh, sandals, which geez. Yeah. When every plant and animal is trying to kill you, a big old nice pair of boots is so much better than sandals. Oh yeah. And he's like, I don't have a tooth lined club. I have a machete, which geez. Yeah. Okay. I'm just imagining him walking in with his tooth-lined club, trying to hack his way through. Like, he looked very little like the trappers in the paintings back home. He didn't mind. He'd rather stay alive. Dusk is a very practical uh, fellow, and he has a lot of respect for these traditions, and he clearly follows these traditions. But at the same time, he's like, well, I'm not going to be stupid. <laughs> I like. He thinks to himself about, like, would I really have been dumb enough to be caught by cutaway vines? And that's where it says, near as he could tell, Sack only showed him plausible deaths. Maybe not, though. Yeah. You know, Sack's on the fritz some during this whole caper. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah. After whatever happens, happens, yeah. Yeah. That old Sack is sitting there going, no, you are that dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Just check yourself, mate. <laughs> He's like, I know you thought you are all big and bad because you wayfinded your way here, but you got to remember, <laughs> who's number one? Sack. <laughs> Sassy Sack. So he wants to go off into the, you know, do his thing, but he feels the need to investigate whatever has happened from all the junk that he's found. So he goes up the coast and he finds the remnants of a large camp. Uh, and like when he goes, there's no sign of his corpse nearby. So either there wasn't immediate danger or whatever there was that was going to kill him would swallow the corpse whole. Either way. Which I feel like is a massive flaw in the design of this bird magic stuff. I'm like, come on. Like you, you got one job. <laughs> you had one job to do. We just did that last week. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to think, like, I'm, I'm sure there's other deaths that wouldn't leave a body behind necessarily, so... But it's better than nothing. I guess, but it's like, surely there's got to be some sort of indication you can give. It's like, if that's a possibility, you need to be able to present the vision somehow. Mm, yeah, I feel like you should... Something. There should be something. I agree. Maybe, like, a an outline, a chalk outline. <laughs> <laughs> but he finds a, a piece of a crate labeled the Northern Interest Trading Company, which is the most generic name. But apparently these are people that he's met with that have been talking about trying to like come out and build a base on these islands. And they've been trying to recruit trappers, we find out, to help them out, because obviously those are the guys who know the islands. That's who you talk to. And I, I, like he's just like, not only are they stupid enough to come out and actually try this, but to actually like set up camp on the beach, the worst place to set up camp? Why do they not listen? So it says he stopped beside a group of gouges in the rock as wide as his upper arm running 10 paces long towards the ocean. So I guess that's not necessarily claws. There's gouges. It could be teeth. <laughs> all I know, but they're very wide. It's uh, yeah, it's not good. Whatever it is. Mm. And they have a steam powered vessel. So, yes, this is the iron clad steam powered vessel is the height of technology on this planet at the moment. So that's uh, that's like Civil War basically era for us. And he's like, well, what happened to that ship? They said that it could take out one of the giant uh, undersea monsters, whatever, whatever they're called. I forget. 
Uh, did shadows. it get? Yeah, shadows. The yeah. deepest of shadows. So hang on, it doesn't say it can kill them. It just says it can rebuff their attack. That's true. <laughs> well, we do find out later that they did kill one though. Right. That's uh, true. Yeah. Or no else, yeah, that that one was already dead and just washed up on shore, and they're just sitting on their iron boat, just going, "Yep, meant to do it." Yep, totally us. One hundred percent. You're welcome. <laughs> they call that a Brannigan victory. <laughs> I just said wave after wave of my own men until he got so full that he died. <laughs> right, men? You suck. Uh, yeah, so no survivors, not even corpses. The shadow must have eaten them all. Jeez. Okay. Yeah. Well, at least the shadow's not wasteful, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> use every part of your kill. Yep, use every part of the human. But then he finds out that there were survivors because he sees some trails leading off into the uh, the the brush, the jungle, whatever. I'd like to buy some human horn. <laughs> and they're all like going off in different directions, running through the 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 jungle in a panic, trying to escape, you know, the giant monster. And he's like, well, that's dumb. You don't do that in this jungle. They're all dead, I'm sure, so... Why even bother? And then I, I like the little dudes who pop out, the little meekers, he calls them, mouse-like creatures, who can transmit a psychic message to him. And they're like, food? Food? And so he's trained these little guys. He told them to bite others, because trappers usually ignore them. So maybe if his training works, he'll give them a, a surprise when these guys try to attack them. And of course, one bite and you're dead. <laughs> yep, one bite was enough to kill. Always, always enough. And so he's like, yeah, make sure you bite everyone who's not me. And he gives them some food. And he's like, hey, have you seen any anyone who's not me, by the way? And they're like, bite others. Right, right, bite others. They were intelligent, but not that intelligent. And then he finds one of the trails. He's like, that trail is going to pass real close to my safe camp. So I guess I'll follow that one since I want to go to my safe camp anyway. And, you know, he just occasionally sees his own body laying around, half eaten in the mud or tucked away in the, a fallen log with only a foot showing. I want to know what does that. Like, there's a fallen log down there, and something's going to grab him and kill him and take him in there. That's terrifying. The log gator. Right? There's, there's log drop bears or something. I don't know. <laughs> Trap door spider. <laughs> Trap door. He's kind of impressed by the way that this person has managed to survive on their way through the forest or the jungle, whatever. Cuts across the game trails instead of following them. Doesn't know how to mask his trail, but also didn't fall into the nest of snap, of fire snap lizards or brush the death weed bark or step into the patch of hungry mud. So, you know, hungry mud sounds like quicksand that, yeah, you know, I that's the only one I relate to here. Death weed bark is horrifying, but not as horrifying yeah. as fire snap lizards. See, I'm just trying to picture this. Like, I feel like everything is just amped up to 11 and how bad it is. So maybe the hungry mud can reach for you and pull you in. Ooh. As opposed to just lying there? Yeah, maybe so. Yeah. You step Let's, on it and, like, teeth appear and, like, grab you. <laughs> the quicksand, like, takes the teeth of the pe victims that it's <laughs> taken and then, like, repurposes oh. them. That'd be oh pretty sweet. And let me just digress a little bit. Again, yeah, redneck sarlacc. Let me just digress a little bit again. Didn't you, growing up, didn't you think you'd fall in quicksand? All, oh, the, all time? the time. <laughs> weren't, you, weren't you watching out for that in your daily life? Like, is that quicksand? Yep. I remember being afraid to go on a sandbox. I think it was a John Mulaney bit. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think you guys are right. Maybe that's where I got it. But yes. No, I agreed with him and you 100%. It's like when you're a kid, you think there's quicksand all over the place. Yeah, you think that's something that you're going to have to deal with on a daily basis. Watch out for that quicksand. <laughs> but that's that's how it gets you. you, never, you you've never seen quicksand. So when you do finally run into it, you're not going to know what it is until you're buried yeah. in it. That's true. I should watch a YouTube video about what quicksand looks like so I know, so I'm always prepared. <laughs> maybe maybe hungry sand isn't really a thing. Maybe he's just convinced himself that it's going <laughs> to eat yeah. him. Yeah. All the other trappers are like, you ever see Hungry Mud? Oh, it's totally, a, it's a joke that they play on newbies. That's great. I love yeah. this. His uncle's like, now watch out for the Hungry Mud. And then like he goes back to have drinks with his buddies. He's like, and I told him to watch out for the Hungry Mud. <laughs> and they're like, oh my god, that's classic. <laughs> that feels he, like one of those. Did he buy it? <laughs> did he buy it? Oh yeah, completely. Oh my god, what an idiot. That well, feels like one of those deaths that wouldn't leave a body, die right? Next week, but you know, like if you get sucked down by the hungry mud, like th there would be Ooh. no body for him to see, like the vision of. I would think. <laughs> yeah, that's so a no good one point. Could prove so he's always just wary of. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, oh, Hungry Mud, it. man. I, I mean, Sack can't warn me about Hungry Mud. <laughs> this feels the, the whole story feels very much like Brandon watched like The Princess Bride, and you're expecting yeah. like ROUSs to show up at any second. Sure, I don't but believe they exist. Like amped up to like you said, eleven. This is this is the fire swamp, but so much worse. Yeah. And he's come to the, he, he's thinking, you know what? I bet they've somehow recruited like a, a trainee apprentice trapper who knows enough to like not get caught in most of the island's hazard, but maybe they're impatient and they didn't want to wait until they're uh, big enough to become a full trapper. So they join this expedition. Experienced trappers were beyond recruitment, he says, which is funny because he kind of joins up with them at the end. So, but he has his reasons, you know. I mean, it sounds more like he joined up with her and she's probably going to just like become a trapper. So she may leave all of them behind. Well, no, but they got to seem to me they got to work together against the ones above. You can't do that. Just being a trapper. I guess that's true. This is the way. But then he handed he, her a mask. Cause she's a founder. <laughs> but he, he determines from like the, the weight of the person looking at their foot st- footprints and stuff. It's like probably a young a young boy, like 16 or so, maybe. Which I love later when he's just like, duh, of course, a woman. Why, it didn't even occur to me. The, the So sexist. Yeah, because women can't do anything. <laughs> well, he tries. He's like, hey, no, there's been female trappers. Like, it, one, there's been, okay, we'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> yeah, I'm I mean, pretty he sure she's just a story himself. they use to tell girls, <laughs> hey, you're not that famous trapper. But I, I do like the way that he's just, like, he keeps coming up with these theories about who it might be. And then he's like, no, you know what? No. I, I'm just I there's no reason to conjecture with no actual evidence. I'm just we'll 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 get there and we'll see what it is when we get there. Which I appreciate. This guy is very no nonsense. And he stumbles and almost uh almost dies to the death ant pod. Which so it's he he just steps on a piece of ground and then he sees the dead body and he jumps back and then there's a hiss of air escaping as a small break in the ground opens and tiny yellow bugs, as small as pinheads, flood out of it to try to grab him. If he'd stood there any longer, disturbing their hidden nest, they would have flooded up around his boot, one bite, and you're dead. And then they just, like, pull back into their nest. And I'm like, so... He says usually there's, a, or sometimes there's a little bulge to show where it is, but nothing this time. So that's just... It's worse than, like, deadly insects. It, they're just there's no way to know that they're there until you step on them and die. Like, I don't see how anybody survives here unless they're him with the magic bird that shows you your corpse. And he's apparently the only one who has that. I, I think I think what we're supposed to understand from him is like he moves a lot faster than the other trappers. They move mm. a lot more slowly and carefully than he does. And, uh, you know, without Sack, there's no way he would have gone out at night. So as he approaches his camp, two of his tripwires have been cut, disarming the traps. Which is not surprising. Those are the obvious ones they're supposed to be found. There's a death ant nest, a larger permanent, cr- uh, a larger one that has a permanent crack in it, so you can tell where they are. And it had been stoppered with a smoldering twig, which I guess somehow makes them not come out. Yes, the old method of pouring uh, metho down an ant's nest and lighting it on fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe it's maybe the smoke. They they like shy away. They won't come out. Yeah. Then there's the night wind fungi that he's been cultivating. Uh, the spores will come out and get you, but they've been watered down, so that won't happen. It's just, it's so hardcore, this place. <laughs> I just can't get over it every time. It's like, oh, and also there's these fungi that the spores will just kill you unless you pour this water feels, over them. This feels like the outsider's perspective of Australia. Yep. Where people just like, every, <laughs> everything there is just going to kill you. And the people ride crocodiles to work and shit. Yeah, how's your crocodile doing? Nah, feeling a bit sick lately. He's got a, He's got a bit of a gummy tummy. <laughs> yeah been there with my horse that i ride to work every day <laughs> let's say car accidents are way worse when they're crocodile accidents mm-hmm. well, i mean it's it's a lot more intimidating if you if you have an incident on the road when your ride can eat his <laughs> yeah. i was just thinking like you know the airbag didn't deploy and the crocodile grabs you and <laughs> it's no good <laughs> I'm trying to imagine an airbag on the back of a croc <laughs> <laughs> it's just like boom but she also cut the next two tripwires that were not obvious. And so he's impressed. He's like, good work, kid. And then he sees that finally one of the traps got her. And he's it's, like, it's in italics. A woman hung from the tree branches, trapped in a net made of jelly wire vines that leave you numb and unable to move. 
Uh, so it's not those ones with the barbs that kill you, but it's ones that make you numb. So I guess something else can come and kill you. Like, I don't even. <laughs> I mean, I guess him so they can't get away. Well, I mean, that's why but he's like, why using it. Why have all these but... death traps? Why well, have all the death traps and then there's that one that won't kill you? That's the one that got her. <laughs> oh, just well, for the story purpose. I was about to say, clearly. yeah, it's clearly just for the story. Because if she'd been dead, well, then yeah. it would have been a very different story. <laughs> I'd be like, well, oh, yeah. there's a dead woman up there. Oh, man. <laughs> but but it's, 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 a good, it's a good point, though. He's a very practical guy. Why would he have any non-fatal traps at all? No. Yeah, you're right. I agree. Maybe it's for catching something else. Like, this is, this is his, like, food yeah. trap. Well, it sounds like they respect each other quite a bit, so maybe this so he, one. This one is not... the woman. And just going, ooh, guess uh, guess what I'm having tonight? <laughs> it's gonna be tonight. good eating. Uh, no, it's like uh, maybe it says they respect each other quite a bit. Um, so maybe he thinks, you know, if somebody could get past all those traps, and they got caught by this one, I'm not gonna kill him immediately. I'm gonna talk to him, and then I'm gonna kill him. Yeah, all good. And. She sees him and she's like, I want to make it perfectly clear that I have no intention of stealing your birds or infringing on your territory. And he just looks at her and he's like, you cut my tripwires. Which apparently is the first time in weeks that he's spoken, which makes sense because he just spent three weeks crossing the ocean in a canoe by himself. I feel like most people would probably get in the habit of like talking to their birds at that point, right? Maybe well, it's just me. He, he, he talks a bit later on in response to all our questions. Like He really only seems to talk when it's absolutely necessary. So yeah. it's like, he's probably the guy who's like, I, I could t- I could talk to the bird, but the bird will not talk back. So what the hell's the point? Yep, he's no nonsense dude. Exactly. I like her response to having cut his tripwires. Is like, I mean, yeah, I assumed that you could replace them. Sorry. <laughs> why? Why is this what we're talking about? <laughs> I I'd like to think that Six of Dusk here has a sign in his house. It's like this many days since my last nonsense, and it says <laughs> it has a zero on it. What does it have a zero on it? He doesn't nonsense. It'd be a very long time since this. Right. Time. So, but now she's coming to his life. So oh yeah. Nonsense. Okay. But apparently, this is someone that he met back at the company when they were when they were talking to him about their plan to put a base out here. And she's like, "Hey, you, you remember me, right? I, mean, I don't want to steal from you." And he just doesn't say anything. She's like, "Please, I'd rather not be hung by my ankles from a tree and slathered with blood to attract predators if it's all the same to you." And this is when we get into the thing where he's like, "You're not a trapper," and she's like, "Well, yeah. I mean, girl." So. He says, there's been female trappers, and she goes, one, one female trapper, <laughs> Yolani the Brave. <laughs> and she's, like, a, she's she's like, I'm not a trapper, I'm a keeper, wink. <laughs> trapper keeper. Wow, yeah, that's that's a pull. I don't know that anyone, a, a, any any of the young people today know what Trapper Keeper is, unless you're a South Park fan and you went back in time and watched uh, the Trapper Keeper episode. Sure, sure. And uh, she's like, can I come down, please? I can't feel my hands, and it's unsettling. And we find out her name is Vathi. And he's like, all right, an improper name, not a reference to her birth order and day of birth, but a name like the mainlanders use. That was not uncommon among his people now. So maybe there is a mainland. Um, I got the impression that the island was or the, the whole planet was kind of a bunch of archipelagos, but maybe there is a mainland. He calls where he's from the home isles. So that feels like another archipelago, but maybe there's a, a bigger continent somewhere. And she has an AVR, too. And it's very annoyed and obviously wounded. And he lets her down. She's like, oh, so you're not going to do the whole ankles and blood thing? And he's like, no, we don't. We don't do that. If you'd been another trapper, I would have just killed you directly rather than leaving you to avenge yourself upon me. Which That's very practical. Yep. OK. And I like the bit where he's annoyed that he's like some of the home islanders. They're just they don't understand that the AVRs are intelligent creatures and you're taken care of. They treat them like accessories. Which is absolutely the kind of thing that would happen and already does happen with people and like, you know, they're they're teacup dogs or whatever. It's more of a fashion accoutrement than you realizing all the care that needs to go into it. Yeah, I don't put clothes on my dog unless he's cold and he needs clothes <laughs> or unless he's like been chewing at himself and I need him to stop. I saw someone on Reddit the other day that was talking about that and how their dog likes clothes. I mean, if your dog likes clothes, cool, but I can tell my dog really hates it. There's actually there's there's a bit on on uh, on a show that I was watching. It may have even been Peacemaker, where it's like, no, I'm telling you, my dog really likes clothes. Like if you don't put him in a new outfit every day, he gets all sad. And they're like, well, do you pet the dog when you put the outfits on? They're like, yeah. It's like the dog likes the attention that he gets from getting the new outfit, not the outfit. And she's like, no, I'm pretty sure he it's the outfits that he likes. Okay, whatever. Sure. Oh goodness. Anyway, so 
I, like, he sees the metal tube sticking out of her pack, and he's like, no, is that a map case? Yeah, whatever. We find out later, no, that is not a map case. That is some kind of weapon. Not exactly a gun, but kind of a gun. Yeah, it's like a gunpowder spear launcher. Yeah. A harpoon. Yeah. Harpoon torpedo! Another Digimon reference for you there. <laughs> so, she notes the the sack on uh, sitting on his shoulder. Not the sack. She notes sack sitting on his shoulder. It's like, is that an AVR? But no, no, it's not. it can't be an AVR. Because all the species of AVR are very well known and documented at this point. And Sack is a different species of bird. It's like, I've never seen a trapper carry a bird who wasn't from the islands. And he's just like, that wasn't a question. I don't have to say anything, so I'm not going to say anything. Yeah, I feel that. <laughs> and he's he's like, how did you know? And she's like, no, what? Which, yeah, she can't. She's not reading your mind, dude. She can't uh, uh, know that what you're asking He's just not used to talking, but it's, it's it's a very weird question. It's like, how'd you know where my safe camp was? Who told you? And she gives him an excuse about following the sound of water, and he immediately knows that's bullshit because he's like, this the water, the stream here vanishes just a few hundred yards away. There's no way she could have heard that. And she's trying to compliment as they go into his safe house. It's like, oh, it's, it's very nice, very roomy for a shack on a mountainside in the middle of a deadly jungle on an isolated island surrounded by monsters. So it's great. And so he tells her to shake out the blankets, check all the bowls and cups on the shelf. And she's like, why? And he goes, well, you know, death ants, scorpions, spiders, blood scratches. I don't know what a blood scratch is, but that doesn't sound nice either. And I like the scorpions and spiders. It's just, oh, you know, scorpions and spiders. Just not the weird, freaky monsters. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, not, surely not. you mean platypus bear. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's no death spiders or artillery scorpions here. Ooh, artillery scorpions. That sounds, that's, that's not good. <laughs> it says the room is built to be tight, but this is Pachi. The father likes surprises. It's it's like the island is the personification of this god, and this is not a very nice god. Well, he's probably just like, will you people get off me? Yeah, exactly. Like, go away. Yeah. Nobody wanted you here. Why do you think I made all the giant psychic monsters in the ocean around here? I don't want you hanging out. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's it's kind of funny considering like. Six, like, Six of the Dusk is such a loner himself, and so he picks the island that wants to be a loner, too. Yep. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's very, and, and this whole part here where he keeps referring to the island as the father, is very reminiscent of what we've already talked about, Polynesian culture, which is, which is this, this is deriving from, especially, like, um, I remember when we went to Volcanoes National Park, it's like the volcano is a god. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, and she's sitting on her throne, and so there's lava coming out or whatever find out that he's got like chicks or uh he's got breeding pairs of birds hanging out up here so they're called trappers but really it's like it's much much simpler to breed the two the birds and get chicks instead of going out and finding all the chicks in the wild he still does that but this is way less dangerous and way more efficient and she comments on him having a big family since he's the sixth that's what his name means. He's the sixth kid. And he's thinking, well, I mean, my dad was a 12th. So he, traditional, traditionally, there's you know, much bigger families. He doesn't say that. He's just thinking these things. Yeah. So it's all, it's all relative. And when he's, he, and he's sixth of the dusk. So she's like, so you were born in the evening. I've always found the traditional name. So, uh, descriptive. <laughs> and like she's trying to be friendly. Uh, yeah, but he's just like, just... man, what a meaningless comment. Yeah. <laughs> she's just coming off. Like, uh, Oh, what's old? What's her name in the pink dress? I don't know. Orian. Orian, yeah, oh, she's coming okay. off very Orian here. Yeah, he's just so, like, eh, leave me alone. Yeah. Sixth is maybe a little bit like Vin, sure. <laughs> and so she's like, hey, there's no bugs in the blankets, and he's like, what about the cups? I'll get to those in a minute. So these are your breeding pairs, are they? And he's thinking, well, obviously, duh. And he's like, why did you even come here? It was a disaster. And she goes, yes. Yep, the whole expedition is likely a disaster. But it's a disaster that will take us in the right direction, closer to our goal. And she has a whole speech about, like, oh, you think the first trappers that came to the island, like, they they probably had disasters. But that's how you gain knowledge, is by failing. And he's just like, whatever, I don't want to talk about this stupid shit. And she's like, well, what about the ones above? What of their technology and the wonders they produce? The ones above coming back. I don't know. Do we have any theories about uh, the ones above? 
we can save those for predicaments if you want. But mm. okay. he bandages up her bird so that it can't fly because one of the wings is hurt. But he bandages them all both together so that it won't try to fly and hurt the wing more. Which yeah, that makes sense. I like he's like you can stay in my safe camp for tonight. And she goes well, and then what? You gonna throw me into the jungle in the morning to die? And he's like you did fine on your way here. You probably won't die. She's like, I can't get across the whole island, which is a really good point, because he thinks at this point that the, her whole expedition is dead except her. So where do you think she's going to go when you kick her out? Is she going to swim home or I don't know? Yeah, I don't think he cares. I think he's like, <laughs> eh, I just don't want you here. You made it here yourself. You can, I'm sure you can find your way back. Don't touch my canoe. <laughs> But he finds out that the main company camp, uh, the bigger camp, is across the island, and that's where she wants to go. And he's like, wait, what happened? And thinks to himself, now who's the idiot? Like, you should have asked this first. So they have two iron hulls armed with cannons watching the waters that can take on a deep walker, 200 soldiers and 100 scientists and merchants. And they're going to find out once and for all why the AVR have to be born on one of the Pantheon Islands to have a talent. Because apparently you can take the same birds back to the home islands and they have babies. They're, those babies are not going to have magical powers. So they want to know. The trappers, or at least some of them, uh, already know. But no one's apparently telling. Or maybe Dusk is the only one who knows. I don't know. It's kind of hard to tell. All the other trappers know that you have to wait till the bird has visited Pachi before you capture it. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they know the details of why. Yeah, I'm guessing they don't know the full details. Like, maybe he or his uncle figured it out, but that perhaps they just assume since the father island, you know, he's the father, that they have to get their power from the father. Hey, Dad, can I borrow some power? (laughs) Cup of power. Give me that investiture. Yep. And she's like, look, I'm sorry. I know you guys. I'm fascinated. I've read all about your ways and I respect them, but this is going to happen. The islands are going to be tamed at some point. It's going to happen. The AVR are too valuable to leave in the hands of a couple hundred eccentric woodsmen. Which, okay, thanks. Jeez. (laughs) If I save your life anymore. Back to the hungry mud. But all the chiefs have agreed to this plan because I guess there's other nations, maybe other archipelagos or whatever on this planet. And if we don't secure the magic, one of them is going to do it. Yeah. Yeah, if we don't do it, the Fire Nation's going to come. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Everything's going to change. Yeah. The Avatar's going to disappear for 100 years. It's no good. And so this is when he's just like, I don't want to talk about it. Go down and check the cups. And she says, but, and he's no! Go down and check the fucking cups right now. Talk to you about this. <laughs> I'm tired of you. I'm tired of this. Get out of my face. And he's like, Father, what do I do to the island? which is not going to help. It just wants to kill you. So, <laughs> Father, what do I do? The Isles like, just die. And this is when all of the AVR, not just the ones in here, but on the island, start like screaming, basically. And he turns around, and this must be the moment that we have the picture of, where all of a sudden his corpses are everywhere, sometimes piled one on top of the other, some bloated, some bloody, some skeletal. One of them, still alive enough to try to mouth some words to him, which he can't understand, which I thought for sure that's going to be relevant. Like there's going to be some revelation (laughs) from his own dying lips, but no, we'd never hear about it again. Nah, he's just having a bad trip. (laughs) We've all been there. He's not. The bird is. Yeah. And so he's like, what happened? What are your people doing that caused whatever this is? Because it's got to be y'all. And when she doesn't want to answer, he goes, he like grabs her and lifts her by her shirt off the ground. It's like, tell me what's going on. Swear to me. (laughs) And uh, he puts her down and she explains. She goes into the ones above. She's like, what do you know about the ones above? Well, they live in the stars. And so the company has been meeting with them, but doesn't understand them. And they seem to have rules, laws that they won't explain. They won't sell us their amazing technology, but they also apparently aren't allowed to take things from us, even as part of a trade. Uh, They say someday when we're more advanced, then they'll, you know, they'll trade with us. And Dusk's like, well, good. If they leave us alone, that's great. 
And she's like, no, no, dude, we have barely worked out how to, like, create ships that can sail against the wind. They can sail the stars. That's way, like, we need this kind of information, this technology, and they won't tell us. But also, they've indicated that there's other worlds like ours. There's other people out there. We're not unique, but they keep coming back for some reason. They want something. And she pulls out a little device. It sounds like a like a compact, like a makeup compact with a little mirror in it. But apparently it shows things like translating languages, or at least between the ones above language and their language. And it shows the location of AVR, like a map. So that's how she found his camp. It's like, hey, there's a bunch of AVR bunched together on this little map thing. I'm going to go there. It's like, we're not supposed to have this. Uh, the ones above sent an emissary and he choked on some food and died. So we took his stuff. I robbed his grave. Also, yeah. Also, how'd you like to be that guy who we find out later they said to die on purpose? Like, that's kind of right? up. Yeah. I, I keep thinking, like, there must be something. Like, he must not really be dead, right? It must be, like, a scam that they pulled somehow. Maybe. But I, I, I feel like these people really went for it. And they're just like, nah, just send him and kill him. It's fine. One of the... Like, basically, Someone take one for the team. There's theories, you know, from fans about, like, every every other planet we're, we've met. It's like, maybe that's the ones above. They they develop space technology and that's who we're they're talking about here, right? So I think maybe maybe the the people who think it's like Skadrians are right, and so it's people from Skadrial and they sent like a they they've got some conjurer or something that they sent to pretend to die, right? I don't know, just random. Of course, I guess all the conjurer died at the end of. I was gonna say, didn't the conjurer all die? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, what are you talking about? Don't hadn't thought dead. of that um, until I said <laughs> that out loud. So yeah, okay. <laughs> you foolish fool. No, they're back. You don't know. Um, they're back in black. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> the ones above seem to be fascinated by the AVR, and she's like, I think they want uh, they want to trade for the birds, but their laws won't allow really, it. I really missed a good opportunity there. I could have said back in blob. Uh, <laughs> I missed out. So and he's like, okay, but that doesn't explain what just happened. Like none of that explains what just happened. And he's still seeing like his corpse hanging out. Not a, not like a million of them again, but like not normal either. <laughs> Hanging out of the trap door in the roof. He's like, oh, that's sloppy. I should close that. <laughs> There's a second machine on the ship, a much bigger machine. The one that she's holding is limited range. The big one can map the whole island and write out a map marking every single AVR. And she's like, and we were going to turn that on tonight. So they must have done that. It takes hours to prepare, so we're going to turn it on tonight so that first thing in the morning we could use it to make the map. And he's like, what, they'd use it without you? And she goes, oh, yeah. No, Captain Usto probably did a dance when I didn't come back from scouting. I like We never find out more about that relationship, but I like just this little window into her relationship with yeah. like, the rest of the party. <laughs> Basically, they're like, uh, forget that lady. And he's like, well, did the machine do this before, like make all the AVR uncomfortable? And she's like, well, no, but I mean, the discomfort's passed, right? I'm sure it was nothing. And he's like, no, I can feel that this is this, there's something wrong. If they use the machine, the results are going to be bad. Something is going to be triggered by that that will destroy everything. And he's like, okay, we're going to stop them. She goes, tonight? And he says, yes. And she goes, no, that's crazy. Nobody travels the islands at night. And he goes, I've done it once with my uncle. And then thinks to himself, that's the trip where my uncle died. But <laughs> I, I, I love the way that's written. That's like a very, um, like, was it Arrested Development? It's like, I did it with my uncle. That's when my uncle died. Yep. <laughs> Very reminiscent of the, the voiceover jokes, yeah. <laughs> Which, once again, this would totally work in a video game. The voiceover humor, yeah. I like that. And she's like, no, the Night Maws are out. I've heard them. And he says, Night Maws track mines. They're almost completely deaf and close to blind. So if we go quick, we'll probably be fine. He doesn't mention here, but we get a mention much later when the Night Maws start following it that their sense of smell is amazing. <laughs> so, I mean, I was going to say, maybe you should rethink this, but uh, he thinks it's very important to stop the thing before morning. So, and she's like, why? And he goes, because if we don't, it's going to destroy the island. Yeah. And also he would die. I feel like maybe that's the urgency for him. It's like, yeah. I don't, I don't want to die. I like being alive. Good point. He tells her her AVR has got to stay here. It's hurt. Come on, let's go. And she goes, no, no, I'm staying here. And he goes, no, you're coming with me because the people of the company aren't going to listen to me. They're going to listen to you. So you're coming. And 
he sees his corpse hanging from the pegs in the tree beneath him and kind of starts. And she's like, what's that? Nothing. You keep looking around. Like, what are you seeing? Nothing. We're going now. <laughs> and she thinks maybe he's gone crazy. She's like, look, you've been alone on the island for a long time. And you're real upset that, about us. I mean, it, and finally he's like, fine. Sack, go sh- sh- do the thing. Show her. And he flies over to her. And now she sees her dead body. And she's very confused. And he's like, yeah, that's the talent that Sack gives you. And she goes, no, that's not one of the talents. He says, you've seen your death. This is what will happen if your friends use the machine. Death for all of us. The AVR, everyone living here, going to die. And she's more interested in the fact that he's found a new AVR. And she, she's like, how did you do? And he's like, whatever, come on, we're going. And so she's got lots of questions. Uh, she's like, you have two AVR and you use them both? And he's like, yeah, my uncle had three. And she's like, how's that even possible? And he goes, oh, they like trappers. I don't know if that's really an explanation, but I like that that's his answer. It's like they don't like you guys. They like us. So, <laughs> I mean, my guess would just be that he seems to breed them. And I assume that's what the trapper's main job is. So if you breed birds, they probably like you more than the average person. Yeah, that's true. But she says it's been centuries since a new AVR was discovered. That's how certain they are that they know all of them and the powers that they give. And so he convinces her to go along. By being like, oh, look, you've seen it. You're going to die. It's like, well, you say I'm going to die. Like that, you, you claim that this is the power the bird has. But but now he gets her out there and she's like, so why did you do this the other time? Why'd you go out? And he was wounded. They needed some antivenom from one of the uh, his uncle's other stores, which I guess he must have gotten there because he survived. But his uncle didn't. So maybe he had to make the end of the trip wounded to get the anti. I don't know. And she goes, you survived? Well, obviously you did. Um and I like she's like, oh, they could be watching us, the Night Maws. And he's like, no, no. If the Night Maws had seen us, we would be dead. That's how I know they haven't seen us. So simple. And she's interested in the bird. Like, hey, are there other ones like that? Well, haven't you brought any chicks to market? He's like, I don't have any chicks. She's like, oh, so you only found the one. OK. And he's this whole time I've been skipping it over. But every time he's like, oh, questions. Fucking this lady with all the damn questions. Will she not shut up and stop asking questions? Oh, my gosh. I'm, I've absolutely been that guy. The. I don't. Oh, yeah. I, I don't want to talk, and you will not shut up. Very annoyed. I'm making the trek across Death Jungle. Stop asking. <laughs> <laughs> I did. No matter how many times you ask, the answer is going to be the same. We're doing it. <laughs> and then he, he, his explanation is: there's a lot of birds like her, but only she has a talent to bestow. And she's like, "That's a mainlander bird. I knew it. I knew I'd seen that kind of bird before, but I assumed it was an AVR because mainlander birds don't give talents." I'm still unclear if Mainlander and Home Isles are the same thing, because they seem to use them interchangeably a lot. Yeah. I uh, I, I also get the feeling, and you guys tell me if you agree, that uh, that Sack is a uh, is, is a crow. Yeah, I mean, just because he's described as black, so I could totally see that, yeah. Very crow, intelligent. Yeah. Plus, you know, the crows have that whole thing about it being associated with corpses, so it makes sense. Sure. It's obsessed with death. Murder of crows, yeah. Crow or a raven, even, yeah. Quote yeah. the raven. Yeah. <laughs> Quote the raven. You're going to die. Yeah. Quote the raven. Check out the, your dead body over and over. <laughs> so she's over here having like a scientific revolution in her, the uh, their whole society's understanding of how the bird powers work. And he's over here like, please just shut up. Yeah. And those don't stop here. No, they don't. And she's like, somebody must have tried bringing a mainlander bird before. But why would they? Everyone knows ABR are special. Why assume a fish would learn to breathe air or race on land? It's a good good metaphor. And then they hear some night, night moss shrieks. And he says they only do that when they have made a kill or when they are seeking to frighten prey. He's like, we got to keep going. And she goes, you realize this changes everything. He's like, yeah, I mean, there'll be new kinds of AVR. She goes, no, that's not even like we assume the chicks raised away from the island didn't develop their abilities because there weren't others to train them. And, uh, he doesn't want to answer her questions. She's like, I mean, that. he's like, I mean, that could still be true. Uh, maybe they can just be trained also. And she goes, well, what about your bird? Was it trained by others? And he's like, maybe. Oh. And he notes a corpse on the ground before him. And by now we're so used to him seeing his own corpse that it's weird when he sees a corpse and it's not his. Because I swear I have to read that twice every time when it's like it was not his. I'm like, oh, OK, this isn't just a corpse vision. This is a dead guy. OK, that's a whole different uh, can of worms. All right. And she's like, oh, is this guy killed by death ants? And he goes, no, Pachi's finger. She's like, is that a is that some kind of curse? It's a name. 
And he's like, I think I know this guy. This guy's first of the sky. It's a terrible curse. <laughs> and she's like, the name of a person, the name of a tree. Just raise the lamp. Shut up. And she goes, I've never heard of that tree. And he goes, well, they only grow on this island, on Pachi. So he's like, I've read a lot about the floor of this island. And it's like, shut up. Hold the light. And so he uh, he pokes the guy's pockets with a stick because you never know what's going to be hiding in there. Right. Everything is deadly. And he gets he finds his book. He's got a book that gives all the details. He's like, yeah, this guy's only been dead for a few days. Here's details about like his safe camps and explanations of all the traps. And at the end is the farewell. I am first of the sky taken by Pachi at last. I have a brother on Suloku Suluko. Care for them, rival. And she goes, he wants you to take care of his family. And Dusk's like, don't be stupid. His birds. Fuck his family. And she goes, oh, well, that's sweet. He's like, well, I mean, we love our birds. We don't want, they need somebody to take care of them. So better to let a rival get them than for them to die. And she goes, but even if it's a rival that you killed with like the traps that you set. And she's like, it is our way. This is the way. And she goes, that's an awful excuse. And he just thinks to himself, well, I mean, she's right. It is. Come out here and kill each other. So I love the explanation of this plant. Like this whole place just gets more and weird and magical where he explains that the plants, like when the flowers bloom, they send out a psychic signal like a wounded animal or something to attract predators. Messed up. Let Pachi claim him. Father did so like to murder his children. And when he explains to her how the plant works, a plant broadcasting a mental signature, she's like, I need one of those flowers and wants to go back. He's like, no, no, come on. We're, we got we got shit we're doing. OK, let's go. You, your people will soon you will have another chance. Your people will soon infest this island like maggots on carry on. And so. The trees were not that dangerous. They live by opening many blossoms and attracting predators. Predators fight each other and the tree feeds on the corpses. So all the plants here also eat people. It's or it's yeah. just a messed up place. Yeah. It's the circle of life. It's beautiful. And so he feels kind of bad about this guy. It's like he must have just stumbled across it as the flowers were opening. Like this is this is how bad it is here. Like even super experienced people, they, you can get got by Pachi. And then she does something stupid while he's not paying attention. Doesn't notice her going for the colorful feather, which we saw him do a similar thing. Like placing a feather to try to attract someone looking for an easy win, which is exactly what she does here. And she gets caught in a trap. A set of spike ropes drop from the tree. And Dusk has to, like, grab her, get her out of the way. And he gets hit by one of the spikes and is all bloody and hurts his arm. She screamed. Many predators on Pachi were hard of hearing, but still, that was not wise. But he's just glad that the trap, uh, the spikes aren't poisoned. So that's good. And she's like, oh, I'm so sorry I found this plume. And I thought maybe there was a nest up here. And he gives her this speech about, like, this is a symbol of your ignorance. Nothing is easy. Nothing is simple. This was placed here by another trapper to catch someone who does not deserve to be here. Someone who thought to find an easy prize. You cannot be that person. Never move without asking yourself, is this too easy? There's some great advice. Maybe not as useful for for us as, you know, people on the island, but still useful, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. When I walk across my workplace, I don't I'm, I'm not like, is this too easy? Should I be able to just walk across like this? Mm-hmm. Uh, Somebody's gonna just... try to kill you at every turn. No, I might actually like my job then. <laughs> <laughs> you can become a trapper. It's all good. Yeah, I'm more of a baiter. <laughs> Bait and switch. Yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I just, just anyway. But he realizes that he's just given her basically like the the speech that you give an apprentice trapper when they make their first big mistake. And he's like. She doesn't even realize the honor that I've just unconsciously paid her. Because I'm giving up such nice guy vibes to her. <laughs> this is not a nice guy profession, apparently. So. No. And then he just comes out with, like, it was not dusk when I was born. And she's like, uh, what? Excuse me? While keeping her distance from the swamp vine, which he hacked through the swamp vine, which then noxious fumes are released when you hack through it that will kill you but it's only dangerous for a few moments so it's fine you just hold your breath for yeah you just hold your breath yeah everything's cool you know it's mustard gas in a vine no big deal (sighs) this place (laughs) (laughs) my mother 
named me because she saw the dusk of our people. The sun will soon set on us, she often told me. Wow, what a lot of pressure to put on your kid. Yeah. Right? And people do that now, though. It's like, yep, world's going to hell. You're going to have to deal with it, kid. I'll be dead. They've been doing that since I was a kid. They're like, yeah. yep, the, the hole in the ozone layer, we're all going to die. Uh, good luck. Have fun with that. We'll do it with our children, and the circle will continue. Just when they start to have this sweet moment where she smiles at him after that, that's when the night maw comes out. And because uh, <laughs> yeah. you you can't have a happy moment on Pachi. That's it. It don't it don't uh, take kindly to that. Oh, good. The island is like. <laughs> <laughs> the island is just like. What is this? Do I smell positivity? Happiness? Smiles? <laughs> Not on Pachi. <laughs> Not like this. <laughs> Not on Pachi's watch. Okay, so. <laughs> Here's where we get a description of the thing. So, would have been as tall as, of, as tall as a tree if it was standing up, right? But it leans forward in a prowling posture with powerful back legs supporting the weight. Clawed forelegs ripping up the ground. Long neck, a beak, razor sharp and deadly. It looked like a bird in the same way that a wolf looked like a lap dog. So it, it does feel like kind of like a raptor to me. Maybe like Initially, it said this, and I was picturing something like a big mower or, you know, like an mm. over, overgrown cassowary or something. But then later on, it says, like, they got no feathers. I'm like, oh, so it looks more like a lizard or something. So a dinosaur. Yeah, it's, it's like an Indominus mm. Rex. <laughs> cassowary with no feathers would look pretty terrifying as well. That is true. I wonder if there's a photo. <laughs> I'm going to look that up. That would be um, horrifying. That, well... There might not be any photos because no one survived taking the photo of it. Right, yeah. I know that I've seen a picture of a shaved bear once and it looked like a friggin' werewolf. Yeah, no, those are that it's a scary thing. I've seen that same one. Yeah, I can't find a picture of that. Hmm. Okay. Anyway, sorry, back to the I like his re, his immediate reaction is to throw his machete at it. <laughs> He's like, We're gonna die, but this but it actually kinda hits him a little bit, cuts the side of the thing's head, which just pisses it off even more. And so she takes her tube thing, puts the butt on the ground, points it, and there's the deafening explosion. And she took it out. Dusk found himself on the ground, scrambled to his feet, backing away from the twitching night maw mere inches away. So it got real close. It was all leathery skin, bumpy like that of a bird who had lost its feathers. And he is amazed. Like, you actually killed a night maw. Like, this has never happened before. And she's like, huh, so that works. We weren't certain it would, but we did prepare these specifically for the Night Maws. And he's like, it's like a cannon, but in your hand. She's like, yeah, right. Not completely dead. It's twitching and crying out. The weapon had fired a spear right into his chest. And Dusk is like, oh, my gosh, we could kill them all. We could kill them all. Every Night Maw. This is amazing. And she's like, yeah, I mean, we talked about it, but they're an important part of the ecosystem. You can't just remove the apex predator. It could have undesirable results. And he's like, undesirable? Fuck you, they'd be gone, all of them. This is awesome. I like how this is a complete backflip of, like, their conversations earlier where he's just like, oh, all this new technology and progress and shit, who needs it? And she's like, no, no, like, we like progress is a good thing. And now all of a sudden it's completely re- reversed. He's just like, oh, my God, we could kill all the monsters. She's like, what? no, the natural world. <laughs> I'm I'm on his side. Kill the monsters, it's fine. <laughs> and she's like, I thought you trappers were like connected to nature and shit. How are you? And he says, we are. That's how I know that we would be better without these things. <laughs> and he's like, no. And like Coker, Coker Lee comes over and gives him an apologetic chirp. And he's like, no, it's not your fault. Even when they can't sense our minds, they can smell us. Their sense of smell was said to be incredible. So this one had followed their trail, basically. It had come across and smelled it and followed them. And so the beast trembles and lets out one last screech. Not as loud as they normally sounded, but bone chilling and horrid. And then other night moss screeches rise up. The sound that he'd been trained to recognize, the sound of death. He's like, okay, we gotta go. Then he, he still hears them, they're getting closer. And it takes her a minute of them going to be like, wait, are they getting closer? And she's like, Dusk, are they get, will they come to the call of the dying one? Is that something they do? And he's like, how should I know? I've never known one of them to be killed before. 
And she's got one more shot, she says. And he's like, one more? And he can hear at least half a dozen screeches behind them. So it's not good. They need to run. And he just knows that they're not going to make it. Like these things, they're going to catch them. They're going to kill them. There's nothing they can do. And then he gets sort of an idea. He's running. They're running recklessly through here in the way that you would not normally move on Pachi because this is a terrible idea. But, you know, somehow he knew that these other things would not claim him. The kings of Pachi hunted him. Lesser dangers would not dare steal from their betters. I just I love that perspective on it. It's amazing. And he's thinking, this is your fault, Pachi. We're your priests, and yet you hate us. I didn't ask for you. I didn't want you. The way you're priests. I didn't ask for priests. And so he leads her to a place that he knows he probably shouldn't. And he's thinking to himself of the dusk of the dusk. What I'm, what I'm, I am now bringing about the end of our society, basically. Although at this point, we don't know that uh, that's why he's thinking this. They follow this little this little stream, the coldest water on the island, though he did not know why. They go between some some rocks and they end up. A place men did not go, a place he'd visited only once, a cool emerald lake rested here, sequestered. And he he pulls her down. He's like, maybe she won't see. Maybe it'll be okay. And they're waiting here, hoping that going through the water lost the night moths, that they won't catch their smell. He's praying to Pachi, whom he loved, whom he hated. And she sees what he did not want her to see. She's like, what? Dust, there's AVR here. Hundreds of them. Shut up, shut up, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so many juveniles barely able to fly. And this he he's apparently he's just given up on it's too late now. He's like, Yeah, they come here. Every bird from every island in their youth, they must come here. And she goes, Wait, 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 what what are you sure? Every bird? He goes, Yeah. It was a thing trappers knew you could not capture a bird before it had visited Pachi. Yeah, he knows what he's talking about. He's yeah. been around the block, sweetheart. And she's like, they gain their talents here, don't they? How is this where they're trained? I like the idea that this is, this is the school. This is there's like a, some there's like a Professor McGonagall and Dumbledore here training the birds in how to use their various magics. But she's like, wait, these trees, those are like those are Pachi's finger trees. And she's like, is it the fruit from these trees? And he goes, no, it's worms. And she's she's like, oh, they, oh, my God, it's not the birds. It's never been the birds. It's a parasite. They carry a parasite that bestows talents. And that's why those raised from, away from the island don't gain ability. And why you brought a mainland bird here and it did gain ability. And he's like, yes. And she goes, this changes everything. And he says, yes. And thinks to himself, born during the dusk or bringer of the dusk. What have I done? Still Pachi's secret. Mm. Pachi gonna be mad. Right? I'm surprised there's not like a volcano just destroying him now. <laughs> and there's the volcano theory for this story. Yep. <laughs> and the flowers are blooming and she's like, wait, that will track things, right? Isn't this dangerous? And he says, no, all mines in this place are invisible always. And she's like, what? Is it the worms? Like, how well, how does that work? And he thinks, why, Pachi, why are you trying to kill me? Maybe it's because I know so much, too much, more than any man had known, for he had asked questions. So maybe none of the other trappers has ever discovered exactly what he has discovered. But now uh, it's going to be hard to keep that from people. And she, the monsters are coming up the river. It, it didn't work. And he's like, she's like, no, I'm not dying like this. Not now that I know the thing that I know. I'm not. We, and he says, she says we can hide in the lake. And he's like, no, no, it's not going to be deep enough. So he's going to try to run out and distract them. Because she's the only one who can save them. She's the only one who can get there and who they will listen to when she says stop the machine. So he's like, I will go and die so that you might stand a chance of completing this mission. But she gets an idea. And it's like, wait, hold on. And they take one of the flowers, these flowers that project the mental signature. And they attach it to the spear and they shoot it off. And it just attracts the night moths away and they leave. And everything is happy, yay. And in the meantime, they're uh, they're hiding in the lake, which is not very deep. It's, it says like two or three feet deep, so you can't even really get down there very well. My assumption, although we don't have any evidence necessarily of it, my assumption is that this is the perpendicularity pool. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's kind of the yeah. sense I got, too. Yes. I don't know why it didn't do anything weird and magical to them, but maybe that explains why everything here is invisible. It's like the magic is so strong here. It also explains why Chris is saying, like, 
Yeah, so none of the teams that we've sent from Silverlight to go and investigate through the perpendicularity have ever returned. N- now <laughs> I get it. Yep. It's like, all right, guys, let's go explore this world. Uh, what is that thing? Oh, shit. <laughs> so after that, everything's cake. They make it back to the fortress. Uh, even Sack is kind of acting normally again. He sees his corpse, but only in places that he would normally see his corpse where there was danger. So it's all good. Such a weird thing to think. <laughs> oh, it's okay. I normally would see it there. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so true. It's like, oh, that's a normal place for a dead body. That's a normal place for my dead body. That's It's a whole different <laughs> ballgame. Yeah, true. Oh, goodness. But anyway, so they get there, and somebody comes out, and she's like, hey, we have to turn off the machine. And they're like, turn off the machine? What do you mean, Lady Vati? She's like, no, you don't have to act stupid. I know. You turned it on while I was gone. And he's like, no, we didn't. Oh, okay. What did you do? We opened it. What the, why would you open it? And Dusk has figured it out already. He's thinking like, oh, I get it. I understand now. And the guy's like, well, I mean, we figured that we should see if we could figure out how the machine worked from the inside. You know, it's really complicated in there. <laughs> and Dusk tries to explain as they're walking away. Like, no, don't you see? Don't seek. It will destroy us. But he's not good at talking, and he's established this many times. He can't, he can't put make words do good. He can't put his thoughts into the machine is death ants. He says <laughs> <laughs> the machine is death ants. <laughs> and Vathi's like, hey, no, I mean, we got here. I'll make sure the machine's not turned on. It's fine. We're gonna be great. I promise. And he's trying to explain it, but she leaves, and they, uh, they don't let him in. So uh, he's like. Okay, I guess, I mean, maybe everything will go back to normal. Could anything ever be normal now? Not only has he revealed the secret, but they've already got a giant fortress on his island with hundreds of soldiers. So distracted that he almost stumbles into a gaping death ant den. Didn't even notice the corpse that sat with there. (laughs) Wouldn't that be an ironic ending to this story? If just at the end he gets distracted and dies. That would be a very frustrating ending. Especially with Zach sitting there going, dude, I, I put your body right there. How did you not see that? Zach almost tripped over your own corpse. <laughs> Zach's just, Zach's just going to go and be friends with Vathi now. Like, that guy was so dumb. I'm just, I'm glad I got some meeting. It's fine. No, Zach, Zach and Six, they're friends. It's, they're, they're, they're good buddies. And Zach, Dusk is just like, starts screaming to the, to the sky. Like, Pachi, you still, you're trying to kill me. The ones who protect you are the ones you try hardest to kill. Why? You deserve this. You deserve what's coming to you. And he's like, you know what? Fine. I'm glad that Pachi's going to fall to the stupid machines. And this is, he starts telling Sack. He finally kind of finds the words. He's like, the ones above have rules. They can't trade with us until we're advanced enough. Just like how a man can't in good conscience bargain with a child until they're grown. So they leave their machines behind. Dude, I hear, I hear a microwave. Oh, sorry. So they leave their machines behind. <laughs> Speaking to try of to, using machines. Right, exactly. <laughs> Th- that's that's the machine. It was just a microwave oven, and they were amazed at beep, beep, boop, boop, <laughs> how advanced it was. Beep, beep, yeah, microwave on you. Yep, that's right. Yes, so, the ones above left the technology to reheat last night's dinner. <laughs> <laughs> They're trying to artificially advance the people of uh, this planet so that they can then get their shit. Which seems like, I don't... Whatever this society is, it has these laws about this, but these people are trying to get around the the spirit of the laws. So I wonder who's enforcing these laws. Like, if you're just like, I, I want to break the law, so I'm going to try to cheat it. There must be somebody enforcing it in a way that you're not just going to break it outright. Because otherwise, if you're going to be this sneaky and shit about it, you would just be like, no, fine, I'm going to break the law. So I wonder who is enforcing these laws. They have their own customs officials, and it's like, what have you got in that bag? Nothing. <laughs> Open the bag. Is that is that a psychic bird? <laughs> no. yes. Those aren't allowed on the ships. Take it back. Really, if people from other worlds knew about the uh, the psychic birds or the, the magical birds, then it seems to me like it would actually be easy. You pop in the perpendicularity, if that's really where it is, and there's hundreds of birds right there. You just don't go anywhere else. You grab one and you leave again. Mm. Maybe the ones above don't know about the perpendicularities. Like yeah, they're just, maybe not. They're just like, um, yeah, interstellar travelers. And then one day they meet someone who uses those. It's like, guys, we've been using this method for ages, and it's so much quicker. <laughs> and it's like, I mean, well, we went through all the trouble. Cute. 
<laughs> we went through all the trouble to invent NASA, and you guys just jumped in a pool? <laughs> We've been teleporting for ages, guys. You are so far behind. And yet technically so far ahead. Yeah. It's a weird dichotomy. Mm. Because if these guys if these guys knew how to use the perpendicularity, like people with outrigger canoes and like compass is their big advancement, they could be going to other planets and stuff. And you're over here like, man, I wish I had a perpendicularity. Shit, I gotta make a spaceship. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, wish I had yeah. a bird. Gotta invent NASA. Gotta invent fucking Velcro before I can even go anywhere. <laughs> and we'd better really land on the moon. Invent NASA and tell them to get off their fannies. <laughs> But yes, so he's going to leave, but then Sack's like, hey, no, dude, look. And he turns he, he turns and walks back a little bit, and there's Vathi. He's like, what? And she says, we found instructions in the machine, a manual that someone left there by accident, apparently, when it was being worked on. I mean, it's in their language, but the little machine I have translates the language. And not only is it a manual on how to use the machine, it explains, like, the concepts and ideas behind how the machine works, which a manual would not do. <laughs> and he's like, well, so you're happy, right? You're going to get your flying machines and stuff. And she pulls out that feather that he handed her. Never move without asking yourself, is this too easy? You said it was a trap as I was leaving. And then we found the manual. They're planning to do to us what we're doing to Pachi, aren't they? And she's like, we can't fight them. They'll find an excuse. They'll take the birds. The AVR used the worms. We used the AVR. The ones above use us. It's inevitable. And he wants to say yes. But what he says is No. And he pulls out and shows her that he got the same feather, the same lesson when he started out. And he's like, no, they're not going to have us. We're going to see through their traps. We're not going to fall for their tricks. We've been trained by father himself for this very day. And she's like, but they're so cunning. He's like, they may be cunning, but they have not lived on Pachi. And so I I really like that perspective on it where he's like, all the, the, the father trying to kill me, now it makes sense. He was preparing us to do what we need to do. To save ourselves. And she's like, so you're going to help? And his corpse appears at his feet. It's like, danger, yes, the path ahead would include much danger. But he took her hand and stepped into the fortress anyway. And that is the end. And later that night, a night maw ate him. <laughs> the whole <laughs> fortress gets destroyed. <laughs> when they were talking about all this, and I just had an image in my head of, like, the ones above come down. It's like, oh, good, you're advanced enough. Now, we want the birds. And um, and Dusk just goes, you want the birds? Have the birds. And, like, just unleashes a trapped nightmare on them. Oh, I, I thought you were going to say yeah. he just, like, holds up two middle fingers. He's like, here's the bird. <laughs> <laughs> you want the birds? Here you go. Got two birds for you right here. Oh, it's a reading pair. Yeah. It's a reading <laughs> pair. Uh, okay yes i love it yeah he's like it's a breeding pair and then vati also puts up two birds look two more <laughs> cut print perfect <laughs> oh man and then they unleash the trap night more yeah exactly yeah. there you go while they're distracted uh, uh, they, or they, they drop them in a night maw pit i feel like that's oh, better yeah yeah uh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah yeah i like it okay so i don't know that we can do predicaments i mean i don't uh I, if you guys want to bust out any sort of predictions or ideas or anything like that feel free we'll we'll, we'll take a moment to to do that but i don't know since we've just okay. ended the story and we don't have a handle on what we're doing next uh, a whole lot then i don't know how much you got so we're reading alloy of law next yes next for next time we are and i'll just go ahead and throw that out since we're talking about it. we're reading the prologue in chapter one of alloy of law mistborn era two cool so just just based on the descriptions we've heard so far, I, I predict that, like, these are going to be gunslingers and they use different metals for bullets or guns and it just, you know, does different things. And what I want to see out of this book is a bullet that heals somebody. You shoot it into them and it makes it stronger. <laughs> OK, <laughs> that'd be that'd be pretty sweet. That's pretty cool. Like like in our D&D campaign where you got the dagger of healing and. People kept being like, like making jokes about yeah. stabbing yourself to heal you, and you kept being like, no, no, just to make it clear, you don't stab yourself with a dagger to heal. Okay, I want to make sure you understand. <laughs> yeah, it was a dagger that could either heal you, or if you forged it the other way, could poison you. That's why it has to be a dagger because it's made out of a fang. Doesn't mean you stab yourself to heal yourself. That's that that doesn't make any sense. Hmm, delicious tea or deadly poison. <laughs> I've got a shirt that says that, actually. It's got like, a picture of Uncle Iroh and says that. 
<laughs> nice. Oh, yeah, I, I bought that shirt for you. Yep, yep. It's like a birthday present or Christmas or something. I'm, I'm going to take Joe's thing about the different metal bullets doing different things a bit further. And it's like, now, if I remember my hemology and alamancy, it's like atium, if there's any left, which there may not be, but if they had an atium bullet, because that atium was all about time and slowing down time and everything else. So it's like, I want someone to have an atium bullet that goes back in time and hits someone before they get there. Wow. Whoa. That's well, that's crazy. Yeah. That's, that's some time they, cop shit. Yeah. yeah. Then they have like a... Then they have like a pewter bullet that creates a volcano for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, he mentioned hemallergy, and I'm like, so what if you like shot a guy and got his power, and then the bullet went through him into another guy and gave him that power? Oh, that would be, be weird. Sick. Let me shoot a spike through you, and then you're gonna get this other power. Okay, my mind's exploded. <laughs> <laughs> I am predicting that there will be a gun slinging tentacle monster. <laughs> nice, nice. Okay. Uh, yeah. That'd be sweet. <laughs> I don't have anything that's real. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. Horrible the... gelatinous blob monster with tentacles that also shoots guns. Yes. It's the most. <laughs> it's the most feared root and tootinous outlaw of the West. <laughs> Tentacle. Tentaclo the boy. <laughs> oh, really, I really heard... the kids like just goes on his head to this guy. Yeah. It's uh. Don't look now, boys. It's the tentacle kid. Oh no, Pa! He's got eight guns, all of them with twelve bullets. Yeah, but you know what he ain't got, son? Family? <laughs> Hell no! A possum killing business is going bangers. <laughs> oh god. Okay, I forgot when we when we got there that we talked about the dead uh, the dead shadow, and so the only mention is there's a what must have been a dead shadow rotted in the sun. It's mountainous carcass draped half in the water, half out. So yeah, we don't get any description. It could absolutely be a tentacle monster. Yeah. Oh, so it's like, like it, yeah, this the dead kraken from that terrible, terrible pirates movie. I'm just gonna, <laughs> I'm just going to, I'm just going to assume it's like a dinosaur crocodile, like more so, like a bigger one. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um. Uh, what was the movie? The croc. It was in, that was in Jurassic World, the mosasaur. Yeah. Crocknado. Crocknado. <laughs> as far as predictions go, I've still got a long-standing one from End of Hero of Ages that I'm hoping to see pan out in this book. So that's my boy. My boy Marsh is alive somewhere. I can't wait to. Oh, I forgot that you said that. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a long oh, time. I, I'm hanging yeah. on to that one. <laughs> it's been a while. Okay. Fair enough. We don't own the rights to that song. You should stop singing it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Okay. So yeah. This has been a longish episode, uh, but we knew that going in because it was a longish, uh, longer section of story than we usually read. We do, however, have two emails that I wanted to touch on, if I can find the right window. Tell us all about the wonderful emails that we received this week, Data. So the first one is from Sasha, who has emailed us several times. I don't know lately. And Sasha says, hey, Data, I have an email thought for y'all. And I guess you can decide at the end of uh, Saturday session whether it's relevant enough to discuss. Sixth of Dusk is one of my favorite Cosmere short stories, but it took a while. The first I'd heard of it was a reference on TV tropes, something about it being aliens make contact with primitive culture from the point of view of the primitive culture. And that sounded fascinating. I couldn't wait to read about all the interactions between these people, all the pitfalls and culture clashes and misunderstandings between members of different civilizations. That's what I was expecting. So when I got a grumpy guy in a canoe and a woman out of her depth... With the ones above completely off screen, it was a tremendous disappointment. I wouldn't say I hated it, but I was completely underwhelmed. But I would occasionally reread Arcanum Unbounded, and when I got back to Sixth of Dusk, I slowly let go of my expectations, if only because I already knew what was going to happen. And once I was reading the story with an open mind, I started to appreciate the nuanced and messy characterization of Dusk and Vati of a traditional society of cultural imperialism. The piece started seeming thoughtful rather the pace started seeming thoughtful rather than slow. And I find it an amazing piece of writing. So, yeah, that is very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I can definitely mm -hmm. say, like, if that's what you were expecting going into the story, why you'd be disappointed with it. Sure. Yeah. I And and, I'll, and his, his comments, or whoever, Sasha's comments reminds me of something I wanted to touch on. I, I talked at the beginning of the podcast about how much I... I really enjoyed this piece of writing and I am, I am, you know, I didn't go into the, this with an expectation and maybe that was maybe why I enjoyed it so much. I'm willing to admit that maybe the reason that I found this so good and so compelling was because 
we got to read the whole thing in one go. And I know due to the nature of our podcast, we don't get to do that almost ever. So I will say that I'm aware of that in my mind when I'm thinking this is the best thing that I've read so far from Brandon Sanderson. I'm completely aware of that. And it may be partially part of my feelings as to why I enjoyed it so much. Because when we do dissect things um, and we think of things that we think would be interesting and then those things don't pan out. Yeah, maybe it is a little maybe you do get small disappointments from going in with things that you're expecting from your pure predictions or whatever. But I'd still say that even without all that, that this is this was really good. Yeah, it's, and it'll be interesting. There's at least one other story that when we get there, actually the one that was originally published with this one, that we'll probably do in one go when we get there, and that is also just kind of a different and uh, intense story. So it'll be interesting to see what you guys think when we get to that one. It's called Shadows for Silence in the Forests of Hell. So this is a cool title, which is why I had to tell you. I'm like, this is an awesome title. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that is quite the title. <laughs> but the, yeah, it's... it's it's about the same length, so that's why why I say we'll probably end up reading, doing the same thing with that one when we get there, because it also doesn't have a good real dividing point. But anyway, so yes, thank you, Sasha. I like uh, I, I I totally get your perspective on that, and I like the the story of the evolution of that there. That was pretty cool. We got one also from Matthew, who says, "Hey, Sander Lanch crew, I've been binge listening to your podcast over the past few weeks, and it has been a joy. Currently, I'm working through your episodes on Mistborn's secret history." I've read most of the Cosmere books, but Mistborn series being my favorite, it's been really fun to be able to re-experience the books in a new way. Like many people, I tend to speed through the books rather fast and slow down. And by slowing down with your podcast, I've been able to notice a lot of things I missed on my first and fourth read-throughs. A couple of questions. What do you plan on reading after Emperor's Soul? Well, I hope that's been answered by this episode, <laughs> so we don't need to go into that. And then what's the link to the Discord? I already sent a link to the Discord. So, so both your questions have been answered. Yep. Thank you Look for at your that. email. Now get out. <laughs> Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Sasha, for your emails. If anyone else would like to email us, the address is thesanderlanchelgmail.com. You can also find us on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and places such as that. And as I said, for next week, we are reading the prologue and chapter one of The Alloy of Law, first book of Mistborn Era 2. Although when that book was published... Since it was supposed to be a standalone, we, they weren't calling it Era 2. At first, he wasn't really calling it anything. And then it was like Era 1.5 for a while. And then that was confusing. And then there's going to be more books. So it was like, fine, fine. This is Era 2 now. We're just going to have four eras instead of three. It's fine. Uh, he was recently talking because after the next Stormlight book, he's going to start working on the next era of Mistborn. Like that's his his whole plan thing. And he's like, I watched an interview with him the other day where he's like, it'll be nice to get back to like uh, – not normal novel length because really like the Mistborn books are maybe like 1.5 times what you might consider a normal novel, but normal for me, novel length of writing another Mistborn book rather than these Stormlight books, which are like 400,000 words or something like that. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to have to look back to see if I'm right on that, but hold on. So this is like rhythm of war word count. Let's see if I, if I, yep. 460,000 words, the last Stormlight book. Wow. So apparently he said in that interview that uh, he's like, you know, people will call you a sellout for anything, no matter what you do. And I've had people be like, hey, write these big books because he's sold out and he just wants to make money off of this. And he's like, actually, both my publisher and bookstores would really appreciate it if these books were shorter because it's like they can sell one of my books for, say, fifty dollars. But it takes up three times the amount of space on the shelf that like a thirty dollar <laughs> book takes. So they could shelve three other books and make ninety dollars instead of this fifty dollars or whatever. Uh, the books. Yeah, yeah I don't. I don't see how making your books longer is selling out. I don't get. No. That. Yeah. It doesn't yeah, that's sense. weird. And he says that his publisher. He starts out by being like, they've offered me significant monetary incentives. If I would be willing to split up a Stormlight book into three different books so they could sell them separately and make this amount of money yeah. off of each of them. And uh, he's like, fortunately, I'm in a good enough place financially where I can make the decision that I feel is best for how I think the book is supposed to work. So when they came and were like, hey, we'll give you $10 million if you split this book up, I was able to say no. And I was like, holy shit, $10 million? Wow. Like, I I, I, I couldn't say no to that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so how long did you say that book was? Four hundred and sixty thousand. Yeah. Okay. So for comparison, the Lord of the Rings, the entire Lord of the Rings, is five hundred and seventy thousand. 
So mm, yeah, it's get it's getting close to the entire Lord of the Rings in one book. Yep. Well, and and some of the Lord of the Rings, the second and third book, is re, re, reiteration of the previous book. Yeah. True. Yeah. That's true of a lot of series, though. Like you always have to recover some ground, especially if you expect that somebody might be picking up that book first. The Dresden well, Files is horrible about that. I just I remember I reading the Two Towers and being like, "Didn't I already read this?" It's been a long time since I read those books. I've read The Hobbit several times because it's like a shorter, more self-contained story. So if I want to just yeah. read some Lord of the Rings type books, that's much easier to take on than me. Like, let me reread the trilogy. Yeah. There's a lot more dwarves. It's more fun. But I mean, <laughs> hey, you could you could reread the trilogy and it probably only take you a little bit longer than Rhythm of War. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which uh, I'm actually I started rereading Stormlight a couple months ago and uh, I kind of quit right after I started Rhythm of War. <laughs> well i don't mean i quit i just mean like that's i that's where i left off i haven't gone back it's just that's what i'm reading in my spare time now and it's been a while since i had a little bit of spare time to go back and read that yeah fair. but so yeah that's it may take me a little while to get through that okay sorry that was a weird digression at the very end anyway <laughs> music by miracle of sound that brand new one time use song that we got this time and next week tune in for the new song that we're gonna get for alloy of law be very i'm sure that's the most exciting bit for everyone is uh, what's the new song gonna be? <laughs> I mean, anyway. apparently you're not like he's done at least two songs based on the red dead redemption games and apparently we're not using either of those so how gunslinging could this book be that was actually that was the suggestion that people made in the discord the other day they were like oh i, I bet he's going to use redemption blues which is one of the Redem red dead redemption songs for this and nope it's uh it's going to be something else which I looked at several songs that sounded kind of westerny, and I ended up going with one that I thought thematically worked better that did not actually sound very westerny. So sure, sure, fair enough. Hey, guess what, listeners? I'm gonna know something for once that you're not. When we get done with this recording, I'm gonna ask Data what the song is, and he's gonna tell me, and I'm gonna know, <laughs> and you won't. <laughs> to be fair, I told you last time. You've probably just forgotten already. I did forget, but I'm gonna <laughs> know it now. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, music by Miracle of Sound. Thank you everyone and watching to the time of next. Colo. Tearing down the walls. Listen to each other, hope